thank you for joining me again today for the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you love the show, please leave a review or a rating on Apple or Spotify. I hope you had a great start to your 2024, and I wanted to take a moment to wish everyone a happy new year. As lost parents, the new year can sometimes be hard. It can feel as though we are leaving our babies behind, or that we should be moving on, starting over, or moving forward. The new year is often seen as a time of new beginnings, yet many of us feel stuck in the same exact place. We're still full of grief, still missing our babies, and many of us may not feel like setting new goals or resolutions. One thing I've learned after five years of being without Jasmine is that the grief simply has to carry over with us. We won't ever have a year where we just start over without bringing the grief along too. Because as I have mentioned before, the grief is with us the rest of our lives. So to think that we can just simply move on just because we're in a new year just doesn't even make sense. All this to say, be gentle with yourself. I promise you aren't going to feel stuck forever. And we all just have to do what we need to in order to get through the hard times. So today I am talking with Heather. She discusses her stillbirth at 38 weeks due to a true knot in the umbilical cord. She also talks about going through depression after loss. And the story today does contain some talk of suicidal ideation. Hello everyone. Today I am here talking with Heather. Heather, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I am a mother of four. I'm in a blended family. I've been married um, for, oh my gosh, like 12 years now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my my two oldest are in college now, so I'm starting to be like the empty nester. So, um, but yeah, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I do acting on the side. I do podcasts on the side. I clean houses on the side. So <laughs> you sound very busy. <laughs> I do, but um, I like it. I like it. It keeps me productive. What is your favorite thing that you've acted in? Um, So my favorite thing was Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. It's a a production uh, through church. Um, It's done countrywide, and um, it's it's a lot about um, where you will spend an eternity. And I got to play a teenage drunk driver who did not make it to heaven (laughs) unfortunately (laughs) it was fun it was fun yeah sounds like a fun role to play like it's not a real life fun thing just fun to act (laughs) yes oh yeah no don't don't drink and drive people (laughs) (laughs) so can you talk a little bit about your last story Sure. So when I was growing up as a child, um, I I had a good childhood. I, I thought of my family as the all-American family. We ate dinner every night together. We watched Wheel of Fortune together. And my parents were entrepreneurs. We helped them out. As I became a teenager, they, they owned a resort in the Branson, Missouri area. So Uh, They recruited us as workers, so we were always just kind of a very close, we worked with our family, and when I was about 19, I moved four hours away to the big city and um, met my husband, we got married, and we were married um, for a couple years, two or three years, and then we decided, okay, we're financially stable, Next step is, you know, let's, let's have a baby. So I was super excited. I got pregnant within the first month of trying. I'm like, oh my gosh, that was so easy. Like life is so easy. Like life is good. And it was a good pregnancy. I was high risk because of gestational diabetes. It just, I don't even know where that came from. It just came out of nowhere. But besides that, it was, it was a healthy pregnancy. I, um, had my baby nursery done by the time I was six months old. I had names picked out by the time, you know, I think I was like 12 weeks pregnant and I'm like, okay, let's pick up names. And I feel like everything was just falling into place. Like everything was just going perfect. And I had my baby shower 
about two weeks before my due date. I think I was about 30, yeah, I was about 37 and a half weeks along. And I remember, um, you know, I don't know about your baby shower or baby showers you've attended, but everybody's happy, you know, everybody's smiling. It's, you know, you're glowing. It's just like a perfect day. You know, you, you play the baby games, you measure your tummy. And uh, what was it? If you crossed your legs, you, I don't know, it was just, you know, <laughs> fun games. I don't know. They took your ribbon away. I don't remember. Um, but I, I, I do remember that day very, very vividly. Um, that was honestly about 18 years ago when this baby shower occurred. And I went in two days later, it was on a Monday, it was my, you know, high risk 38 week checkup to, you know, see how everything was going. My baby was already estimated to be about nine pounds, because whenever you have gestational diabetes, you're known to kind of have a bigger baby. Um, so I went in for just a routine checkup. And my husband was going to meet me there. So I went by myself. And they uh, they could not find the heartbeat. And at first you're thinking, okay, everything's fine because babies move sometimes, you know, where they might've found the heartbeat last time, you know, so they spent about, I mean, I don't know, in my mind, it was forever. I think it was maybe five minutes where they tried to search for the heartbeat. And at that point, my husband walked in the room and he could tell something was up. And at that point, I started getting very anxious. And the nurses left, or I guess the nurse left, came back in and said, you know, the doctor would like to go ahead and just do an ultrasound, see what's going on. I said, okay. And so me and my husband both walked into the x-ray room. And, you know, within minutes, we found out that his heartbeat had stopped. And that he was gone. And at that point, you know, he was a seven and a half pound baby. He would, would have been nine pounds if I had gone full term. And I think at that point, I'm just in shock. No tears fell. It was more you're just kind of in denial, in shock. You know, my doctor was very compassionate. He said, I'm so sorry. I had been with my doctor for years, so I loved him. And it's always good when you have a doctor that's that's compassionate. And um, so he said, you know, go ahead and, you know, get dressed or get your things and meet me in my, my office. I said, okay. So we're both just kind of standing there, like not even talking to each other, me and my husband, because we're just so in shock you know, this was two days after my baby shower when I got diapers and baby clothes and nursery decorations. And I hadn't even opened and unwrapped, you know, or put away all the gifts yet. Our nursery was 100% complete. And now all of a sudden, it's, it's just my baby's gone. And so we went into his office and he said, you know, um, we're going to have to induce you and you're going to have to deliver this baby. At, at that time, I was 24, so I was pretty naive to even stillborn babies. I, I'd heard of miscarriages. Um, I, I think I only knew of stillborn when I think I witnessed a, a dog giving birth when I was nine and it was a stillborn puppy. Like, that's literally all I knew about stillborns. I didn't even know what happened to women. I, I was so... You know, like I said, I, I had a good childhood. I, you know, I didn't have a lot of traumatic events. And they always say what what our parents don't teach us, society will. So I guess this was, you know, <laughs> something I was just learning through the process. And he said, we're going to have to deliver sooner than later. Do you do you want to do it today? <laughs> like, and I was like, I guess, I mean, I don't want to go home with this baby inside of me knowing that he's not alive anymore like that. So I said, okay. And so 
I mean, I'm pretty sure my hospital bag was in my car because they always say pack your hospital bag, you know, two or three weeks before your due date. So I'm pretty sure I had my stuff. And so he did not take me through the waiting room because obviously there's soon to be moms in the waiting room. So they took me through a back hallway. And before I knew it, I was checked into my hospital room, you know, putting my gown on, getting ready to be induced. And I knew I had to call my family, right? Like, where do you even begin? Like, I just had my baby shower two days. Like, I'm going to have to tell them. Like, so I knew my parents were out of town. So at the time, the only person I could think of was my grandma who lived near my parents. I don't know about your grandma. I mean, mine's now in heaven, but she was the sweetest. You know, how do you... How do you call your grandma grandma and say my baby died like how so i remember calling her because i was trying to find my parents really so i called her and you know she answers a very sweet voice and the words could not come out of my mouth i was literally there's there's very few times in my life where i'm speechless and this was one of those times i couldn't i couldn't do it i started crying i'm like i can't and I handed the phone to my husband. And at that point he started making the phone calls. And so I'm pretty sure my mom came back um, that day, you know, back then cell phones weren't as popular as they were. My parents had landlines. It's not like we could just call them while they were on the road. <laughs> so I don't even know what happened. I just know four hours later, they drove across state and they were at the hospital with me. So, um, so they did induce me. Um, my husband called his family. They lived local. So they came, you know, before my parents obviously could come. And people are there for support, you know, but they all came into my room. So here I am with 20 people in my room. My husband, um, a coworker of his that was like family to us. Um, I had my husband's stepbrother, his wife, you know, his mom, his dad, and they were all just staring at me like, what, what do they say? Like, nobody knew what to say. I'm starting to feel labor pains. It was the most awkward feeling I have ever been in. When you're vulnerable, you're laying in a bed. You're about to deliver a baby that has passed away. And they were just lined up at the foot of my bed, basically, just kind of, you know, and I understand like they were there for support, but from my perspective, I'm like, I want you all to leave. <laughs> <laughs> like I get it. And to this day, 18 years later, I don't like all eyes on me. It's just one of those triggers and triggers affect all of us throughout our lives. We don't even realize we have triggers till something happens. And I remember the nurse coming in, she would check me and um, I didn't want to show them that I was in pain because it's nothing like being in labor with 20 people watching you. So I remember curling my toes in the bed and like holding on tight to the bed railing and trying to get through a contraction without like drawing even more attention to me. And finally my mom came and everybody <laughs> leave it to mom to be like everybody out. And at that point I could breathe, you know, I, I was able to, I think my mom was more emotional than I was. I was still in shock. I was still, you know, in denial, just going through the motions. And I think, you know, um, that happens a lot when we go through traumatic events for all of us. Um, it's like you find yourself just going through the motions. And I did deliver him. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, seven and a half pounds, something like that. And he looked perfect. He looked like a baby that was just sleeping. What I did not know is when you deliver even a stillborn baby, they still lay them on your chest, which I was not prepared for that. And I think it was one of those, I'm sure the nurses just maybe did it out of habit. Like you just, they want to clean you up. So they just automatically 
put them on your chest. But so here I am and it dawns on me, oh my gosh, there's like a dead baby on my chest and it's my child. And so at that point I broke and I started crying and I was like, I couldn't talk. And, you know, like words weren't coming out of my mouth and uh, they ended up cleaning him up, wrapping him in a blanket and they handed him back to me. And yeah, he looked like just a perfect baby sleeping. And I, I think I held him for two or three hours because I knew if I gave him up, I would never see him again. And so, you know, you, you still play with their pinky, you know, you hold on to their little fingers. Like he literally just looked like he was a sleeping baby and he had curly hair and, you know, we even opened his eyes to see what color eyes he had. And, um, so two days later, I find myself planning a funeral. Like I didn't even know baby funerals were a thing. Again, I'm in my early twenties, mid twenties. I didn't know baby caskets existed. I didn't know there was places in cemeteries specifically for babies. I had no idea. So again, I'm going through the motions. I'm in shock. They're like, here's some headstones. Here's our catalog of headstones. What would you like on it? You know, there's blue caskets for boy and you know, pink caskets for girls. And they're literally like, I don't know, two, three feet long, if, if that. I mean, they're small. And I remember the money that we had saved for our baby when we brought him home, we were now putting towards planning his funeral. And we planned a graveside funeral. Co-workers came, family came. There was about 60 people that came to support us. And again, all eyes on me. I mean, and I remember asking the, um, the, the pastor, whoever did the, you know, the graveside um, service, I said, you know, when I get to heaven, is my baby still going to be a baby? Like you think about these things. Um, especially when at the time I had not been baptized, I was not close to God, but you know, you get these questions that go through your head and, you know, he didn't know, he, he's like, you know, I guess we'll know when we get there. And so I was officially on maternity leave. Like I had delivered a baby. I took a six week maternity leave. My body was healing. My breast milk came in two days later. I had no baby to give it to, um, I just remember like being crouched in a fetal position on the side of my bed on the floor. Just at that point, I started crying um, and I wanted to hide. Like you just want to hide from the world, like nothing. There was nothing anybody could say to make me feel better or to bring my baby back. So I felt very alone. Like I felt like I was the only person I ever knew for this to happen to. So I felt very... Um, almost like you have the scarlet letter on your forehead and you're just known as, oh, there's that girl that had the stillborn baby, you know, two weeks before her due date. And so maternity leave, I actually went back to my parents' house across state and I basically lived with them for six weeks. And I think that was my way of hiding from the world. You know, I didn't have to go to my corporate job eight to five. I didn't have to, you know, even answer the phone if I didn't want to answer the phone. And I think during that time I was still in shock because <laughs> I think sometimes grief, you know, it doesn't hit right away. It's It can be delayed and it can be delayed up to two, three, six years. So I do feel like definitely, you know, the grief had not hit me yet. Again, I, I was not familiar with grief. Like I didn't know there were five stages of grief. I didn't know you know, shock and denial are some of the beginning, you know, phases of, of grief. So I did move, you know, went back home, went back to work six weeks later, as if nothing happened, you know, you're at your desk, you got to clock in, you got to clock out, you got to do file work, you got to answer the phones. And, uh, you know, six weeks went by and it was as if, okay, I got to move on with my life. I can't grieve. I can't cry. I got to be a wife. I have to, you know, do my responsibilities at work. So the grief, what I did have, what had not hit me yet, I just pushed deep down. You know, I just kept pushing it deeper and deeper and deeper. I do remember at work, 
uh, we had the same UPS delivery, the same mailman, and they would see me and be like, congratulations, I see you had your baby. Again, I'm in shock. What do you say? And I believe it was like the UPS guy was the first day. And I'm like, oh, I didn't like to say my baby died because that's such a harsh word. I always said, oh, my baby passed away because it just made it sound softer. So, you know, and then his smile as he was congratulate, congratulating me, you know, all of a sudden turns into sadness. And he's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And then I would walk back to my desk and be depressed the rest of the day as I'm still trying to do my reports and answer phones and, and you know, and then the next day it would be somebody else. It would be the mailman or it would be, you know, it was like every day we would go to a restaurant for lunch. Um, every Friday we would, we would call ourselves a lunch bunch and it would be about 10 of us ladies from the office. We'd go to the you know, same few restaurants. And I remember going to one of the restaurants and the waitress remembered me as being pregnant. Congratulations, you had your baby. I think at that point, I just looked down and I didn't say anything because it was just so, I, I felt like I was just getting getting it from all sides. And that's when, you know, some sadness started hitting, but what really started affecting me first was insomnia. So I would go home and I would relive all these days over and over. I would relive delivering my baby. I would relive people saying congratulations to me and relive the the funeral. And I could not sleep at night. And every time I would close my eyes, I would just see that black hole of the ultrasound where the heartbeat once was, and it was just black. So then I couldn't close my eyes because then it would make me sad. So I would just lay there and stare at the ceiling and... I'm sure we've all struggled with insomnia during some point in our life. And I don't know about you, but like when I struggle with insomnia, it makes me more emotional. Like some people get angry when they have no sleep. You know, it makes me very, very emotional when I go days and days and days without sleep. So then I'm like emotional insomnia. And I wanted to have another baby because I had this nursery. When I got home from the hospital, I closed the nursery door. And I, in my mind, I've locked it away. I don't even want to go in there like baby shower gifts, the bedding, the nursery was all rainbow themed. Actually, it was my bedding that I had when I was a baby um, was in there. <clears throat> it was like, I didn't, I didn't want to go in there. I couldn't go in there. But part of me is like, I want a baby. I still want a baby. And so, you know, my husband and I talked and um, as far as my husband, you know, we all deal with, with grief differently. And I'm sure men deal with it differently than women. And all I was, I was very involved with my own grief to this day. I don't even know how my husband was dealing with it. Like I never asked him, how are you doing? Because I was dealing with my own, you know, stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm sure he was struggling too. So we both agreed that, you know, yeah, I mean, we, we can try again. So the doctor did call me, I forgot to say this, that he did call me a few weeks after I delivered my stillborn baby to, to tell me what happened. And, you know, you think, is it my fault? Is it something I could have prevented? Is it, you know, maybe there's something genetic, maybe it's, so all it was, was a knot in the umbilical cord. And there's two kinds of knots. There's the um, the false knot, which can be a kink in the umbilical cord, which usually doesn't cut off the air supply. And then there's true knots. So this was a true knot that was like a shoelace knot. And it literally just wrapped and got tangled and cut off his air supply. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, like something so simple as a knot. It wasn't wrapped around his neck. It was just a knot in the cord. And so knowing that, that's when we decided, okay, you know, let's, let's try and have another baby. So again, I got pregnant a month after trying, which my excitement immediately turns into fear. So I'm still struggling with insomnia. So now on top of insomnia, I have fear of, oh my gosh, something's going to happen to this baby. I just know it. 
So then I can't sleep because out of fear and I can't sleep because of grief. So I really don't sleep for about eight months of my pregnancy, which is about how long <laughs> you know you're pregnant. And I did deliver him healthy after weeks and days of no sleep. I talked to my doctor. I said, I want him out as soon as possible because last time I got to 38 weeks, I'm like, <laughs> get this baby out as soon as you can. He's like, well, we really can't do it before 38 weeks. And I said, okay, well at that 38 weeks, I'm like going to be in your office. <laughs> like, you know, and he, and he totally understood again. He was very compassionate. He actually retired this year. So I'm very sad, but, <laughs> um, so he agreed. So we, I, again, I got induced. Um, I think I was, um, you know what? I wasn't induced with that one. Um, that one, I didn't realize I was having labor pains. And, uh, cause I didn't really know like what labor pains felt like when you don't, when you aren't induced. And I do remember like at midnight, like, oh, my back hurts. Oh, my back hurts. And then it would go away. And I'm like, oh, my back doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> and, and it would come back. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if this is labor. <laughs> so, you know, again, I'm, you know, a little naive. <laughs> and uh, by the time we got to the hospital, I delivered him two hours later. Um, so yeah, I was, uh, I think by the time I got there, I, I was uh, pretty, pretty far along. So, but either way, he was delivered very healthy. It wasn't until his first birthday that my deep depression hit. So I, I had insomnia and fear. Then I was okay for the year that he was a baby. And then my depression hits. Again, I said, you know, grief um, <clears throat> can be delayed. So I do feel like, you know, I thought everything was fine. And then all of a sudden we have this birthday party, <clears throat> excuse me, and it dawns on me, oh, my baby in heaven, he's never going to have a birthday party. Like he's never going to be aware, do a smash cake or he's never going to to get married or graduate high school. Like he's missing out on so much. And it made me really sad. And that I think was the start of my like hard grief. I still had a little bit of fear, insomnia still kind of lingering. Um, but that's when it hit that, yeah, my baby's gone. Like he's in heaven. Like, and I got really mad at God and I was like, how dare you dangle this in front of me and tease me only to take it away 14 days before I was going to deliver him. You know, why do you, you obviously, or why do you allow this to happen? Like that was one of the questions. But the other thing was, you know, God, it would have been easier if I had done a miscarriage. Why did you make me carry him almost to full term? So then I was angry about that. So my anger was really strong and my depression got really strong to where I started getting suicidal ideation. And... I had a reoccurring thought go through my head for about a year of what I would do. Um, and it's not like I didn't want to be with my husband or I didn't want to be with my, my current son, because I think when we get suicidal ideation, it, it's, it just takes over your mind. There's no, sometimes there's no justification. There's no, it just, it's like, it consumes you so much that's all you can think about. And I remember one day I was in my bedroom and I'd had a knee injury. And so I had prescribed uh, painkillers. Um, and I remember laying there with my, my baby in the other room and I had all these pills and I spread them out over my bedspread and I counted them and I said, how many can I take? to where I won't have to be here. And I was like, God, do you like to see me with insomnia? Do you like to see me fearful? Do you like to see me depressed? Do you like to, you know, see me paranoid? Because this is, if this is who you are, God, I don't want to be a part of you. 
And I remember those pills to this day. I remember those pills. And the only thing that stopped me was my current baby in the other room. And I was like, well, I can't leave him without a mother. And so I put the pills away. And the next day I called a uh, counselor. And uh, I, I wasn't a Christian at the time. I mean, I had attended church as a teenager. You know, I believed in God. I had my teen study Bible. Um, but it's not like he, you know, I had surrendered my life to him in any way. And I was still very angry. But part of me said, I want to be with a Christian counselor. And so I looked up, you know, Christian counselors in the area. And I started talking to her about my, you know, my story and my questions. And um, she then, you know, referred me to a psychiatrist who was able to give me medicine because she's like, yes, you, you definitely need to be on some medicine just to help you, you know, because at that point I still had, you know, um, depression to the point uh, when I would go to work, I wouldn't even function or you know, the suicidal ideation. I still wasn't sleeping good. Um, I was, I'm five, nine and I was down to 114 pounds, which is about 20 pounds underweight. And it's not like I didn't eat. I just, maybe I wasn't eating the right things to gain weight, but you know, and we're carrying grief. Like you can lose weight, you know? And, uh, so I, I went to a psychiatrist and it was the worst experience. I walked in and he said, he said, your eyes are set back. No, wait, first I said, do you want to hear my story? And he goes, I know your story. You don't need to tell it to me. And then he said, your eyes are set back and sunken in. Are you anorexic? Yeah. I was like, what the heck? Now, again, I'm in my mid twenties. I think I was... 27. I didn't know you could change doctors. I didn't know, you know, if somebody refers you to somebody, I just go to that person. <laughs> Needless to say, I did not like him ever. He was not very nice. His office was always dark and there was a lamp in the corner and, but he did give me some medication. So, um, you know, and I did go see him. I always felt uncomfortable going to see him you know, it's, it's like I go from having a compassionate doctor, you know, who helped me with my baby to this guy that, you know, is accusing me and not making me feel good whatsoever. And so, uh, he put me on some medication, which did help me, but I think I still had that anger and my anger rolled over into my marriage and my depression, you know, was still there and the questions were still there. And I do feel like, you know, I was just so angry that my marriage kind of fell apart. Now there was a lot of other factors into our marriage falling apart, but I'm sure this didn't help, you know, the situation. So I did file for divorce. Um, my son, you know, that I delivered was four. Um, and then, you know, a year later, I find myself as a single mom in an apartment with my four-year-old again, moving through life, going through the motions, still dealing with grief because, you know, antidepressants, they're not going to take away all the grief. Like it's still going to be there. Like it can mask it sometimes. It can help you sleep better, but you still have to process the grief. So, um, I think I finally broke one day at work and I could not stop crying. And I think that was the moment. I, I feel like we all sometimes come to a breaking point. Like you can only be so strong for so long and then it's going to hit you. And my divorce grief fell into my baby grief. So then I was just like this big mess of grief and it all just started coming out in tears because I think I had held back so many tears. Um, and I found myself in the bathroom at, at this at the time I worked for a financial advisor firm. So here I am in their bathroom, like crying uncontrollably. And I sent myself home and I could not stop crying. Like it just kept coming and coming and coming. 
And that's when I was introduced introduced sorry to a, um, a support group. It's called Divorce Care Ministry, and it's found all over the country. You can find it through different churches um, that will host it. And a few months later, here I am at a support group, sitting in your circle. <laughs> you know, and and I laugh at the at, you know I'm laughing now because it's like oh my gosh you just you never imagine that's who I would be like here I am I I was this you know I thought I had this good life as a child and you just don't know where adulthood is going to take you and you don't know the journey you're going to go on and I I again all eyes were on me um but they all had stories too, which made me feel good. You know, in a way it's, it's uh, comforting. And I did share about my baby, even though this was for divorce, but I did feel like that was a, you know, obviously um, that was part of the reason I think we got divorced was because of my, you know, the after effects of everything. And, um, but I do remember I found healing in that group, you know, for, for you to, you know, one week you talk about anger, one week you talk about sadness, one week you talk about, you know, there's a different topic every week. And it was Christian based and it did talk about God. And I did learn a lot about God, that he's not my enemy and he doesn't promise that we're going to have a perfect life. You know, life is going to be hard and it's going to be challenging. And I remember um, I became friends with one of the guys there. We were kind of close in age and, and, uh, you know, he would, he would call me, I don't know, maybe once a week and, and he would pray for me because I had not prayed to God. Like I refused to talk to God at one point. And so I think because he would pray for me, it got me into like praying and talking to God because I had been so mad at God. I was flipping the finger at him <laughs> and cussing him out. I, I mean, if just take, the strongest hate you could possibly have towards somebody, I had it towards God. So it took me a long time to soften my heart and to put my walls down and to realize, you know, um, God's taking care of my baby in heaven. Like I had to really take my thoughts and, and turn them around. Um, you know, in God's word, it talks about, you know, you change your mindset and that's what I was doing. I had to change my mindset, um, you know, and, and it, it even talks about how Jesus wept, like Jesus cried too. Like who's to say he was crying when that day happened or he was crying with me at the funeral. He was crying with me when I was in bed with all these pills, you know, surrounded by me. Um, you know, and I start thinking, okay, maybe God prevented something bad from happening to my baby here on earth. You know, maybe that was his way of, of keeping my baby safe or, um, you know, I think now, heck, I want to be in heaven. I don't want to be here on earth. Like who wants to, <laughs> um, so through that, I joined a church and I did end up surrendering my life and being baptized in 2011. And I've been with the same church now, you know, for about 12, 13 years. And, you know, I've come to realize that, you know, sometimes God allows bad things to happen to draw us closer to him. Or so we can help others. Like I've now met other people that have had stillborns and have had miscarriages. And you're like, oh my gosh, like we aren't alone in this world. Like there's other people who, who have been, you know, in my situation. And um, so that's why I'm here today, you know, sharing my story because, um, you know, I, I feel like, I can help somebody by sharing my story, you know, and, and I don't have anger towards God anymore. <clears throat> you know, I, um, you know, my why questions are never going to be answered, you know, but I can only focus on, you know, the family I have now, like I said, I have four kids now. So I got remarried, had another baby married into, you know, two stepdaughters. So here I am with a family of four with one in heaven you know, I, I, my, my husband's a Christian, we're a godly family. And so I do feel like through that hardship and through the trauma, I, I did get a blessing, you know, and, and I do, I enjoy my life and I have joy in my life. And I, I wake up every morning with a purpose, you know, I either serve others, share my story. Um, so yeah, I do feel like 
no matter how hard life gets, I do feel like, you know, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, yeah. So <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing all of that. Oh, I mean, no I think, problem. I think so many people don't really understand that, you know, when we lose a baby, it's not just the baby that we lose, you know, we, we lose ourselves and we lose and, and, you know, like there's so many of us that, um, like you, like was your experience that, you know, go into depression or increased anxiety or, you know, just all these things that people don't understand who haven't been through it. Especially when, you know, it's one thing when they come to your funeral, but you know, it's good to ask somebody even four or five years later, how are you still doing? Because yeah, like I talked about, there is delayed grief and we think after the funeral, everybody's healed and everybody's good. And we all go back to our houses and yeah, you know, we, we definitely grieve in different ways and, you know, it can take up to 10 years for somebody to, to deal with grief and process it. So. But I found too, that, you know, people show up, like you said, like for the funeral, for the first few months, few weeks, and then it gets less and less. And then we still are here carrying all that grief with us, like for the rest of our life. Yeah. And then all of our support people are kind of gone. I'm like, okay. <laughs> right. and, that's, and that's part of how I felt. I did lose my identity during some of that. And I did feel like, again, oh, I'm the only person that this has ever happened to. So I did feel very alienated, alone. Um, at that point, my parents didn't live near me. I just had my husband who in our marriage was falling apart. So it was, you know, um, and that's why support systems are such a huge thing. Like, you know, there are so many different support groups, grief share, healing is a choice, divorce care that, you know, I feel like for those that really want the help, like there's help out there. And even if it means going into a room of complete strangers, like I guarantee you after that class, you'll be family and you'll have lifelong friends. It's just a matter of, um, finding the courage. I think the courage to, well, the humility to ask for help, like, cause nobody really wants to ask for help. Right. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have humility and obviously courage to, you know, face it. You got to face things sometimes. I think that's hard too. Cause I, you know, we, none of us want to like face the grief head on. It's like, let's just stuff it under this rug. So we don't have to think about it. Don't have to deal with it, you know, but then it comes out in an explosive way. Right. Right. And, and it'll affect people, you know, our grief, it's like a domino effect. If, if my grief affected my husband that now, you know, affected my son because he had to go through a divorced family and he had to now has a stepdad and, you know, maybe we would have also been divorced if it wasn't for that event, but it's all a domino effect. And it's just a matter of how we deal with it and allowing ourselves to deal with it too. Like you said, we, we stuff it down. And for years, I never shed a tear because I felt like I had cried so much and my heart was so bitter when I was angry with God. I probably went five years and did not shed a tear. Like that's how hard my heart was. And now I'm to the point I watch a cute doggy commercial and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so cute. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable and allow ourselves to cry. And, you know, something that they teach in um, Healing is a Choice is sometimes go watch that sad movie that's going to make you cry. And that's going to make the tears come because we can get so, you know, set to where we don't want to cry. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And they're like, no, you've got to release it. You have to release it. So, I mean, I would yeah. find a song. There's a song by Natalie Grant. I think it's called Held, where she she talks about losing somebody. And that song would always make me cry. And uh, it would make me sad. But then the next day, somehow it would make me feel better. So it's like you have to, you know, you have to be vulnerable. I think that's good advice though. Cause you know, like, like we said, we don't want to cry. We don't want to, we don't want to show the emotion. We don't want to deal with it, but right. I think to be strong, like you got to be strong mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. But yeah, choosing those moments, like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to choose this time. I'm going to let it out. And then you do feel better, Yeah. but we just avoid it for too, too long. I mean, and, I know I'm guilty of it. Yeah. And if it means like in my, in my family right now, like my husband, I have kids, if it means telling your husband, you know what, mom needs off for tonight. I'm going to go to the bedroom. I'm locking the door. 
I'm watching some girly movie. I need a mental break. And I do that to this day. Like I don't do it often, but I don't know, maybe once a month because all my <laughs> busyness will catch up to me. And I'm like, order pizza. Mom needs a mental break. And I think that's something as moms, like, it's like, I don't have time to have a, a mental break. I don't have time yeah. to, <laughs> to go, you know, I've been known to go in the closet and cry in the closet. <laughs> but you deserve that too, though. Like you deserve just, it's okay to, to take a day off of, if you can, of, of mom life and wife life and, and be like, okay, dad, you're in charge. Now, if you're a single mom, obviously that's different because I was a single mom for, for about three years, two years, something like that. And yeah, single mom life is definitely hard and kudos to everybody who's ever been a single parent, because you don't get that time. You don't get that time, you know, to, to have alone time or whatever, but yeah. Yeah, that's, it's all hard. It is. <laughs> you know, life is hard. It's just a matter of how we deal with it. It's a matter of our attitude, you know, and having that support system or even a friend where you can just call them and be like, I'm having a hard day. Can we go out for coffee? You know, because if we try to deal with it on our own, like I, there is no way I could even run my family on my own. I, I'm constantly asking others for advice and be like, you know, where is the manual for raising teenagers? Like, <laughs> Like, give it to me. But um, <laughs> yeah, I just know, like, I used to be a very prideful person in the sense of I always thought I can do it on my own. I got this. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. But the older I get and the more experiences I go through, I'm like, I know nothing, <laughs> nothing. Help me. <laughs> so definitely important to, you know, ask for help. Well, and I don't know about you, but I definitely am, am a person who I want to be in control of everything. And, you know, going through my losses, I felt like I had zero control over any of it. And that made it worse for me because I'm like, I can't control this. I can't, I can't change it. I can't do anything about it. And that was really hard. Yeah. And then sometimes you try to manipulate it to, to change it. So you're mm -hmm. like somehow like trying to manipulate it and be like, okay, if I do this, then I'm still in control, but yeah, it doesn't always go as planned, but. I know it's like, I just learned, you know, as I go on that um, there's very few things I actually am in control. Of. Oh, absolutely. Like I can control what happens to the dinner. It may burn, it may not. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the other thing is like, I have learned to just enjoy the little things and, you know, when, when your children want some attention, you know, a lot of times we can be busy and be like, no, mom's busy, mom's busy. But I think when we do go through, you know, baby loss and losses like that, you know, you kind of have to do a reality check and be like, you know what, my kid just wants to play Uno for like five minutes. Like, mm -hmm. let's play Uno. Um, so I've really tried to embrace that. And, you know, the laundry can wait, the dishes can wait. If my child wants me to go watch him ride his bike up and down the street for five minutes and it brings happiness, to, I'll, I'll do that, you know, cause we just have to make time and, and it's made me more grateful, you know, for the family I have. And, you know, like I said, I don't have any anger towards God anymore. Um, you know, it's almost like you get angry, you have to blame somebody, right? Yes. Either we blame our husbands, we blame our kids, we, you know, whoever, I just chose God. Um, but yeah, it's just really taught me to, you know, just slow down, just slow down in life and enjoy it through the hard times, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything else that you'd like to share, Ed? Um, you know, just the fact that, you know, I just want to reiterate that we're not alone in this world. You know, there's always somebody who's gone through our experiences and, and maybe not exact, but, you know, similar. And, you know, I just want to, you know, say again, like we just, we can't go through grief alone because I did it. Um, and, you know, it caused me to go and spiral out of control and, so like I said, there's so many different support groups, just get on Google and, you know, you will find them and um, yeah. And to just, you know, 
it is going to be hard. This, this life is hard, but you know, it's a matter of, you know, how we deal with it. And, um, life is only hard as we make it, you know? So, yep. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing your story with us. I think there are so many people who have been in that very dark place after loss. The place where you may question if you have anything left to live for. I've heard it from several different lost moms and dads. You may feel like you'll never get through the pain, that you'll never be able to live without your baby. And I'm here to tell you that you do have so much to live for, and your life is absolutely worth living, and you are very important and very meaningful. The pain of losing a child is like no other. It feels like our world has ended, but I promise you, things do get better. We always carry that grief, but not every day will be a horrible grief day. Please find someone to talk to. Find that support system. Don't ever try to go through it alone. And if you are ever dealing with suicidal thoughts, please seek help immediately. Call a doctor, call a friend, call a family member, call someone. And you can always call the suicide hotline at 988 if you're in the U.S. Or you can text HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741-741. Remember that your life is worth living. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you love the show, please leave a review or a rating on Apple or Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning in, and remember, we are all in this together. <laughs>